can you relate? Because there is hope. There is something better. Because you are allowed to be loved anyway. You're allowed to be valued anyway. You're allowed to be accepted, warts and all, anyway. Being forgiven of being redeemed. There's evidence in your life that each one of those things is true. And those truths don't change regardless of how you feel about them. And I'm allowed, just as you are allowed, to feel safe in these truths. And I'm allowed to have company too, so I don't have to do it alone. Even God said, it's not good that man be alone. We're not supposed to do life alone. Thank you so much for having me here, folks. It's super cool. <laughs> I was last here and I was reminded last week because I thought, oh, I've never been to Oak Creek Church. No, I actually have been. Um, I was here many, many years ago. I believe it was um, 2012 or so that I was here. Um, and I was asked to um, share some of my experiences when I worked in corrections. And um, then too, it was super cool to be here. So I like the consistency in being able to come and share here at this congregation. So thank you again for, for having me. Um, when Pastor Rhoda asked me to um, participate in um, your mental health series called MindFit, I thought, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm all over that. I'll be in there. And um, she asked me to talk about um, spiritual health as well as how it coincides with mental health. And I thought, well, cool, that's right up my alley because that's what I'm trained to do. The Lord called me to uh, serve in the field of chaplaincy. So you may be familiar with the term chaplain, but that's the old school term. New school term is a uh, spiritual health practitioner. Um, I actually have the title of spiritual health advisor at Cedars Recovery, where um, I've been working for the last four years and, I've been, and for the last 10 years, I've been working in the field of addictions. So helping people um, engage their spiritual health in a positive way while tending to their mental health um, concerns and issues and needs um, has been brilliant for me to be able to walk alongside folks in doing that. And one of the things that I found was um, especially... Um, amazing and affirming for me was that so much of my story is echoed in the stories of those that I serve at the treatment center. Though, um, you know, well, many of my, the, excuse me, my brain just came online. So hold a sec. Though many of those, um, you know, suffering from addictions and, and not just substances uh, at the treatment center where I work, we don't just, uh, address substance abuse addiction. Uh, we deal with all forms of addiction, so including what is often termed as process addictions. Um, so things like um, watching pornography, um, relationships, that's an addiction where you go from one relationship, one intimate relationship to another. Uh, we look at gaming, because video games is a uh, is a, is a serious addiction as well that is just as engrossing and encompassing and pervasive as any of the other addictions. We look at disordered eating as well as um, gambling, um, social media, and um, media-associated um, addictions. We cover all types because it essentially works the same way in the body, especially, and from a spiritual health perspective, the same impacts on the spirit. And so having the opportunity to walk alongside folks um, in their healing and recovery journey has been tremendous. And finding the, and hearing so much of my story echoed in theirs. So for as much as I, as far as I know, don't have addiction and I'm not in recovery, so many of the experiences, so many of the issues of hurt and shame and fear building and, and not feeling like you're good enough, believing myself to be so much more worse than I actually am, that gets echoed. 
And that's where I count it a huge honor to be able to sit with people. This is where I sit and actually relate with folks. And they're surprised that someone like me, like me, who's not in addiction, can actually relate with them. And they're grateful because they thought they were so weird. They thought they were so different. They thought that no one else could understand. And so being able to, again, come alongside and deliver hope to these folks is a tremendous, tremendous front row seat to the miracles that happen in healing. And so some of the things I wanted to share with you today, and I'm going to do my best to keep it moving because there's a lot of information. It might feel like you're drinking from the fire hose for the next little bit, but bear with me, folks. We'll be able to get through it. And so some of the things I was wondering if you could relate to is some of the things that we have up here. Here, okay, technology's working. Okay. In looking at low self-image, even though in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul talks about how we are God's workmanship, and and the original Greek word uh, for workmanship is poeia, where we get the word poem from. And so it's a creative work. And so for as much as we can um, accept that God has created us and created us in his own image and he, God don't make junk, I still think that I'm a piece of garbage or whatever negative picture. I still have this vision of myself. And I was wondering if you could relate to that. One more thing that we could, uh, wondering about relating to the the mental obsession, Uh, just the the worry, the worry that we go through, things that preoccupy my mind. There are times where I've spun on stuff from the time I wake up to the time I go back to bed and then I have a terrible sleep. Continually spinning on stuff and, and, and having it consume my day I was wondering if you can relate because in Matthew chapter 6 Christ talks about how you don't need to worry you don't need to worry because God sees you he sees you he sees the little birds and he feeds them he sees the lilies in the fields and clothes them none of them are you know the Solomon wasn't clothed as well as the, as the flowers in the fields, and he sees you. And yet, for spinning on, when, when is that next bill coming? Did I make enough? Is that paycheck going to stretch enough? I got bills to pay, and it's consuming my mind. Can you relate? I was wondering if you could relate on that emotional compulsion where worth. There's icky feelings. I don't like icky feelings any more than anyone else. And those icky feelings are icky enough where I want them to go away right now. And they need to go. And when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the weight, the weight of the situation that he was in, because he knew what was coming, he knew the cross was coming, and and all of the trimmings that go with it. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's like, Father, please, if this cup can pass from me, that'd be really awesome. However, sometimes I, you know, paraphrase. Don't worry, I take it from the Chaplain Karen's Revised Standard Version, okay? So just bear with me a moment. But yeah, he's in the Garden, and he's stressed out to the point where he's sweating blood, and he says, Father, if this cup can pass from me, That would be really great. But you know what? Your will. Not my will. And I suspect that in the garden, he, as he was stressed out, those feelings were pretty icky and then probably feeling close to being overwhelming. And yet he was able to catch his breath and say, you know what? No. I will get through this. I'm willing to trust that I'm going to get through this. But it's hard because those icky feelings are really, really icky and I don't like them. 
can you relate? I was wondering if you could relate to maybe some psychological dependency. Notice I didn't say issue, but a psychological dependency. We're, 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 it's like, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, I want something else. I want something better. And I'm thinking, you know, I want it now. Well, I want what I want when I want it. I want it. I need it. I got to have it. You know what? And I'm going to be getting it. Because what I'm dealing with right now is just too much. And I'd rather feel better right now. I'd rather feel better right now. Because feeling better is more important than being able to get through. Christ talks about this in in Matthew as well, where he has folks pause and say that, you know what, the stuff that you're trying to surround yourself with to feel better about yourself, don't worry about that. Because someone can break in and steal it. The moths can eat at it and destroy it. If you store up your treasures in heaven, that's where your heart's going to be. Because wherever you put your treasure, wherever you put your thoughts, wherever you think your worth is, wherever you think that you can feel better, that's where your heart's going to be. And you're worth so much more than that. So much more than that. You can have, you're allowed to have so much more than that. And sometimes I forget that when I'm in the moment and, and, well, I want what I want when I want him because I don't like what I got right now. And it gets hard. It gets really hard. But I was just wondering if you could relate. Could you relate to that rigid negative attitude? Well, it just sucks anyway. Yeah, but you know how how often the yeah buts come in and yeah but and you start the rebuttal, right? Your butt tends to get in the way sometimes of being able to see something positive. And after a while, everything gets painted with that same negative brush. Christ talks about that too. He says, you know what? When you judge, you're going to be judged the same way. So think about that. And whenever I do think about that, then I remember, you know what? Judgment can go the other way too. Too often we go to the condemning side, to the oh yeah, right side. And we just figure, no, it's it's not going to get any better. Or we use those platitudes, well, it is what it is, right? Because I think it is, therefore it is. And you can't tell me any different. That doesn't work very well like that. So I was just wondering if you could relate. Or that defense system, that rigid defense system that you use to try and protect your heart to keep from hurting any more than you're already hurting. Try to protect your heart in the ways that, well, that don't work very well, but I'm sticking to it because, well, there's some measure of success. Allows me to survive so far. But that rigid defense system that says that I'm right and you can't tear me down by telling me I'm wrong. I'm right. I think I'm right, therefore I am right. And you can't tell me any different. Because I'm trying to protect me. I'm tired of hurting. And sometimes that anger comes up. Underneath anger always is one of three emotions. Shame fear, or offense, some sort of hurt. Always one of those three is under the anger. Sometimes all of those three. I know for me enough times it was all of those three. And mixed in with all those other things, especially that low self-image. Oh, I'm going to be I'm gonna be coming out swinging if you push me far enough. Because I'm trying to protect me. Tired of hurting. But I don't know. I was just wondering if you could relate. Could you relate to that feeling of 
powerlessness. And not in the sense that, you know, oh, well, here I am. Tidal wave is coming. I can't stop it. No, more in the sense of, well, I can't not do that. I know there are times where it's really difficult for me to walk into the dollar store and not buy something. <laughs> I'll walk back out and buy something. Or there's times where I just, I just keep going. I tell myself, okay, just one Pringles. Okay, maybe just two Pringles. Okay, maybe just three more Pringles. Can't not, but I can't stop. It gets hard sometimes. When it just seems that, you know, you know how that, that really nice, that really nice purse was calling you from the window, from the window in the store, you know, or get up in the morning and no, no, I'm not going to pick up my phone. I'm not going to check my Facebook. I don't need to. Oh, sorry. I'm old enough the Facebook. I'm not going to check my TikTok. I'm not going to check that. But I'm not going to check that. Well, okay, maybe just, just one minute. And then an hour and a half has gone by. I was just wondering if you could relate. The delusion. Thinking that true things are untrue and the untrue things are true. And I know I'm right. I know everyone's looking at me in the store when I walk in. I know everyone. All of that one person that looked at me, that's everybody looking at me. Right? I was just wondering if you could relate. Could you relate? Or even that physical dependency. Where just after a while, whatever, after a while, meh, what's the point anyway? That hopelessness, that despair just t- tends to settle a little bit more, a little bit more a little bit more darker, a little bit darker, a little bit heavier. It just seems to settle a little bit more in just the whatever. And you just don't care anymore. Or at least you try to convince yourself that you don't care. I know I try to convince myself, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, I'm miserable, but I don't care, whatever. those days where it just seems that it just doesn't matter that I don't matter. Christ talks about that too. He says that you're more valuable than anything else. Anything else at God's creation. But I find that really hard to believe when I believe that I'm just a real piece of whatever how could I possibly matter when I know that I'm not good enough how could I possibly matter when I know that I've screwed up how could I possibly know that I matter how could I how could I possibly matter when everybody's looking at me funny everyone's judging me How could I possibly matter? It's really hard. It's really, really hard. But I was just wondering if you could relate. If you could relate to even up to about four of these, one, two, three, four of these, I think it'd be really good for you to find someone who understands the hope that you need and be able to connect with them. Christ certainly does. He's gone through all of that. He's he's felt through a he's felt a number of these things, if not all of them. Actually, I think he felt all. 
So he's got a clue. But again, if you can relate to like one, two, three, four of these as being consistently present in your life, find someone who can understand the hope that you need. Talk to them. Let them see your heart. Let them see into your heart. Let them hold you for a moment. Just sit there and share space with you. Let them show you that you do matter, that your voice matters, that your story matters. If you can relate to five or more of these things as being consistently present in your life, well, here's my business card and it, find someone who's trained to deliver you the hope that you need. Find someone who is trained to come and help you see what else there is to see so that you can find that glimmer of hope and continue to walk towards that light and not walk alone. Have someone with you. Have company. It's not so bad having company. For as much as I grew up with learning to do things on my own and to figure it out myself and to get her done because nobody else knows what they're doing, they're going to mess it up anyway. Because, of course, if you want anything done right, you got to do it yourself. Yeah, see? Yeah, y'all grew up like me too. Okay. My people. Okay. We can relate. You can relate. If you can relate to most of these, if you can relate to all of these, please find someone to sit with you. Find someone to deliver you, who's trained to deliver you the hope. Because there is hope. There is something better that we can look forward to. There is evidence, and you've probably tasted glimpses of it from time to time, of getting relief from the... of life that sometimes comes. When you're sitting on the corner of the bed and going, please make it stop, make it stop. And then you get a little bit of, just a puff of relief. And then you try to do something to get more of that relief, but it doesn't quite work and it doesn't last as well. But oh well, you try again. Can you relate? Because these symptoms are actually the essential symptoms of addiction. Addiction is, clinically speaking, a pathological relationship, love relationship, to mood-altering substances or behaviors. So it's not just about drugs and alcohol. It's about anything that you begin to have relationship with and that relationship supersedes, it overrides, and it is far and becomes um, priority in all kinds of ways that make it easy to ignore. Hence the delusion, hence the powerlessness. These are the essential symptoms of addiction. These are the essential symptoms that we contend with. These symptoms, unfortunately, are unhealthy coping mechanisms. And many of the folks who come to the treatment center where I work, they realize it's not about the using, it's not about the drinking, it's not about the drugs, it's not about the video games, it's not about the sex or the relationships or the porn, it's not about the disordered eating. It's not about the exercise and working out six days a week for four hours at a time. It's not about all of that. They realize that in their personal iceberg, there's so much more below the surface than there is above. When you see an iceberg, you're only seeing 10, maybe 15% of the whole iceberg. And icebergs build from the bottom And if we think, if we can relate to the iceberg model, there's so much more beneath the surface that if you really knew was there, you would like. 
that if you really knew it was there, you wouldn't like because I don't like it. So I have to hide it away from you with my rigid defense system. And for as much as I appreciate you taking your time to be with me, yeah, I know you're judging me. You're giving me that bombastic side eye. There is so, so much that goes on in trying to cope and not coping well. There's so much that goes on in the lives of those that are afflicted by addiction. And you notice it says on there, only addicts have all nine, which would strongly suggest and imply that all non-addicts have some of the nine. When I first started working in this field, one of the senior um, counselors told me that. And my mind went, oop, uh-oh. So I started going through the list. On a good day, I think there's only eight. Maybe eight and a half. And so I do treatment every day I go to work. But I'm grateful for the awareness because when I start seeing these symptoms showing up in myself, I realize, I remember that I can have hope. That there is something better to look forward to and I'm allowed to have it. For as much as I try to convince myself that I'm not, that I'm undeserving of good things... It's made clear to me that there is no law against me having good things. I'm allowed to. Am I willing to receive? Am I willing to receive something better? Am I willing to receive the hope? Am I willing to receive the peace? Am I willing to receive the joy? Because what I have, which is opposite to those things, kind of sucks on a good day. And I'm tired of it. I'm worn out and I'm worn down and I... Just done. Tired of fighting and feeling like I'm not getting anywhere. I'm tired of fighting and telling myself with my frontal lobe, the logic center of my frontal lobe, telling myself I have to do it better. It's got to be better. It should be better. It needs to be better. Well, at the back of my brain, in the limbic system, my amygdala is telling me it's never going to be good enough. That amygdala that primarily holds fear-based emotions and my shame sits there and feeds my fear well can you relate because there is hope there is something better Pastor Rhoda can connect you up with resources um, as you need to find at the very least find that person that understands the hope that you need at the very most, to find that person who's trained to deliver the hope that you need. Because you are allowed to be loved anyway. You're allowed to be valued anyway. You're allowed to be accepted, warts and all, anyway. You're allowed to be forgiven. You're allowed to be redeemed and there's evidence in your life to prove and to confirm and to support each one of those statements of being loved, of being valued, being accepted, of being forgiven, of being redeemed. There's evidence in your life that each one of those things is true. Each one of those truths is true. And those truths don't change regardless of how you feel about them, regardless of how I feel about them. And I'm allowed, just as you are allowed, to feel safe in these truths and live like someone who believes them. I'm allowed. And I'm allowed to have company, too, because I don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. None of us is to do it alone. Biologically, we're designed to do life in relationship with others, to others. 
Even God said, it's not good that man be alone. We're not supposed to do life alone. And as far as I'm concerned personally, I'm tired of trying to do it alone. So I'd like to have some company. So if you're willing to join me in getting well, come, let's hang out. Thank you.